Welcome to Green Talk here at Green TV. I'm here with Zach Goldsmith, environmentalist, former editor of The Ecologist magazine and parliamentary candidate for the Conservative Party in Richmond Park. Zach, thanks Thank for chatting to us here in your office. You recently decided to go into politics. Tell us why. Well, I've been campaigning on environmental issues for years. I mean, since I left school 15 years ago or so. Um, and I've tried every type of campaign, raising cash for campaigns, getting involved actively in campaigns, starting up campaigns, environmental journalism. And I have come to believe, rightly or wrongly, that actually if you really want to get stuff done, you've got to get into the machine and you've got to start thinking up and pushing policies, trying to identify those levers that are going to deliver the change we need. What is the role of the individual in combating climate change versus the government? I think you can't really have one without the other. If there isn't an appetite among the public for green solutions, then politicians aren't going to be rewarded for doing the right thing. They're not going to be elected. Um, so that appetite needs to be there. But politics, you know, politicians need to provide leadership. I mean, an example of that is energy efficient light bulbs. We know that if every light bulb in this country was energy efficient, you'd save the power equivalent of about two nuclear power plants. But people know that largely. You've had Live Earth, you've had endless campaigns to ask people to go and get the best light bulbs. Very, very few people have. And I think there are times when the government just simply has to provide leadership and actually raise the standards. And appliances are a good example of that. Is a reduction of CO2 emissions by 80% by 2050 really a possibility? I think we can achieve it. It's impossible to know, but technology is improving all the time. We don't really know the full effect some of these tax shifts that we're proposing will have. You know, for example, our car tax. I think it'll be very effective. I really, I mean, transport is a huge contributor to climate change, um, and I think our car tax mechanism would work. It's about making it very much more expensive to buy dirty cars and making it very much cheaper to buy clean cars. So any increase on the dirty cars is matched pound for pound through discounts on the cleanest cars. I think that will make it pretty easy and obvious for people to go and buy the cleanest cars and they'll then obviously save a lot in the future through lower petrol bills. There's high awareness amongst the British public, but do you think they're prepared to stomach the cost of green taxes? Our approach in this report, and I think it's the right approach, is, is really not about punishments, it's not about pain. Um, I mean, obviously there are sticks, but they're matched by carrots, and, and, and we, we've applied that throughout the entire report. So I can't think of many or indeed any areas where what we're recommending is going to require people to live lives they don't want to lead. And I really believe that. So, you know, obviously there are difficult issues there. Aviation is a difficult issue. But even there, we're targeting specifically the fastest growing sector, about a quarter of all flights from Heathrow, for example. We're targeting those flights where there is a reasonable rail alternative. And the view is that you tax one and you use the money to improve the other. You recently said that people don't really know about peak oil and that it's quite important. Tell us what that is and why it is significant. And I think it's a matter of fact, obviously, not opinion, that oil will eventually run out. We just don't know when. Some people think we're beginning that process now, other people think we have a bit longer. But our view is that whatever the argument, weaning ourselves off dependence on oil makes sense. We're dependent for every aspect of our lives. The water we drink, the food we eat is brought to us courtesy of uh, cheap um, uh, oil, the clothes we wear, the plastic. Oil is a massive part of our lives and I don't think people fully realise that. And I think we do need to move as quickly as possible towards independence, oil independence, or you know, re reducing our, our, our dependence on oil. Where do you stand now on nuclear power? The policy in our report is a market approach. We're saying that if it comes to the use of government money, i.e. taxpayers' money, that shouldn't be invested in nuclear power at all because you get much bigger return investing in other things. So, for example, if you spend a pound on nuclear power versus a pound on energy efficiency, you're going to get seven times more solution investing in energy efficiency than you are investing in nuclear. So the government's job is to ensure the biggest possible return on taxpayers' money. Um, and that's never going to be nuclear power, it's incredibly expensive. So we're saying the subsidies should be used to support small home generation of energy, which is what we've seen in Germany very effectively. One town in Germany, 200,000 homes, generates more solar power than the whole of Britain. And I think we should follow the German example. They got it right, we got it wrong. You recently interviewed Leonardo DiCaprio in the September issue of The Ecologist. Now, celebrities are often criticised for having a huge carbon footprint, does that lessen the impact and the message that they have? 
When I interviewed him uh, for his, about his film, he was about to do a press conference, and again, all people wanted to talk about was how did you get here. But I'm much happier that he got there. I mean, how's he, you know, from America to Europe? Is he going to swim? Is he going to take a boat? I think he should be out there doing whatever it takes to get the message out because he's one of the, you know, he's he's a rare he's a rare phenomenon. I mean, the the, the environmental campaign runs through everything he does. What is your vision for a sustainable Britain? And how optimistic are you that we'll achieve it? Well, I think the key, I mean, if you had to boil it down to one issue, I think it's scale, it's the human scale. Whether it's economics, whether it's democracy, whether it's our energy infrastructure, whether it's the way we build homes, whether homes relate to one another, I think it does come back to localism and scale. And this is a big narrative that runs through our, our report. I have an extraordinary situation here in Richmond where a supermarket is being built, local people opposed to it, the council objected to it, but it was overruled by the central government. And it just seems to me extraordinary that a legitimately, genuinely local issue could be impacted so heavily by central government. So I, I, I think the, the, the future, if we're going to have a sustainable future, is going to be based much more on localization of politics, localization of economics, return to the human scale. Zach Goldsmith, thank you very much thank for chatting to us on Green TV.